This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. One motorcycle gang rules the U.S. Canadian border with an iron fist. Hell's Angels love to kill people up front. They like coming up close and popping a guy in the head. Their reign is fueled by sheer terror. We had something like 160 bodies piled up. It was a bloodbath. You use hunter strategy in this game. It's predators and prey all the way. The Hell's Angels will do anything to eliminate their competition. It was basically just open season. They'll stop at nothing to control the flow of drugs into the U.S. It's better to join with the Hell's Angels than get a bullet in the head. Montreal, a city of one and a half million people, just 45 miles from the U.S. border. Its cobblestone streets give it a European charm. At night, a different side of the city emerges. Glowing neon lights mark a dark underworld of drugs, prostitution, and violence. It's all dominated by the Hell's Angels. When the Hell's Angels move into your country, they're bringing that whole international weight that comes with being patched with the best known biker gang in the world. Montreal is Mecca for Hell's Angels. They're home away from home up north. With over 100 members in the area, no one disputes their power. Their operation is all about one thing, money. The Hell's Angels made over $115 million on the sales of cocaine in about a year and a half. They're in charge of drug sales and prostitution and every other vice. The Angels have adopted a basic strategy for dealing with competitors. Give them a warning. If they don't understand the warning, beat them up. If they don't understand the fact that they just got beat up by the Hells Angels, kill them. It's a simple business plan. Eliminate the competition. Here in Montreal, they moved into areas where uh, minor players were playing and uh, they beat them up. Uh, they beat their way to the top. It was complete and utter intimidation. Andre Bouchard battled the Hells Angels for over 20 years as part of the Montreal Police. Even in uniform, Bouchard was taunted by the gang. It would happen every day. But in my time, if a guy would have told me, I'm going to hurt you, I'm going to kill you, somehow, I would have broken his jaw right there. Bouchard witnessed the Hells Angels grow from a group of small-time thugs to a national crime syndicate. When you saw a gang of long-haired bums with tattoos and a motorcycle, hey, who the... What's this? You know, not, nothing told us in the beginning that this was going to be trouble to the extent that it did become. The Angels' red and white empire has spread to nearly every part of North America. The Hells Angels, or HA, boast 124 active chapters and 1,300 members. Their expansion has created a lucrative drug market. You can't separate what the Hells Angels are doing in Canada from what's going on in the United States. The guns, the drugs, uh, they all move easily across the border. Each chapter helps the other. 
Canadians don't have guns the way Americans have guns. Guns are much more accessible in the, in the state. So you have guns going north and you have drugs going south. Cal Broker is one of the few who has crossed the angels and lived to tell about it. They're dangerous men. They'd tear you apart and finish their sandwich, you know? Cal worked as an undercover agent. To get in with the Angels, he posed as a crooked businessman with drug connections. His tough, no-nonsense attitude served him well. I am what I am. And uh, you want to do business? Let's f go. Let's do business. You want to move coke? Let's talk coke. I want to talk the big stuff. Cal quickly learned that in the Hells Angels world, no one is exempt from a beatdown. Not even a rival's wife. They'd be at a restaurant somewhere or a club and uh, talk about going out and, and blindsiding somebody's wife because they owed him 500 bucks, going up and hitting her in the face so hard you broke her eye orbits and smashed her nose. These brazen attacks made the Hells Angels one of the most feared gangs in the world. And they would do anything to stay on top. Nineteen ninety four. The Hells Angels were trying to consolidate power in Montreal. This meant taking out rival crime syndicates and anyone else standing in their way. The prize complete control of the city's lucrative cocaine trade. Calling the shots for the Angels was 41-year-old Maurice Boucher, AKA Mom. Mom was one of the most feared gangsters in the biker world. Like Al Capone, everybody knows who he is, everybody knows he's dirty, everybody knows he's a killer, but the police can't seem to nail him. He became sort of the rock star image of the Hells Angels. Boucher embraced the gangster lifestyle and the limelight. This guy used to walk up and talk to the journalists and talk to the newspaper, put his arm around people and have his picture taken. He'd have this smile there that would, you know, I'd want to punch him out, you know? Mom was a cutthroat leader with one agenda. Own everything. All of a sudden, Hells Angels are, 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 are basically becoming like Walmart. They're saying, you know, we're taking over everything. You have to buy from us. We control everything. You have no choice. Not everyone was happy with the arrangement. A lot of people didn't want to do business with the Hells Angels. They didn't want to be in an organization where they knew if they stepped out of place, they would be shot in the head. The Rock Machine was a drug dealing powerhouse not willing to bow to the Angels. The gang was comprised of independent drug dealers, club owners, and a few disenfranchised bikers. The Rock Machine very deliberately stood up to the Hells Angels by recruiting the independent-minded people, the ones who felt squashed, people who felt betrayed or pushed out or just mistreated by the arrogant H.A. Mom Boucher caught word of the revolt and ordered the rock machine to disband. But they decided to test his resolve. Rock machine says, we're going to keep going, and you can't do a thing about it. Problem was, the hells could, and they had a lot of killers. And at that time, uh, I'd say in the early 90s, people started to drop. In just over a year, there were more than 20 murders between the warring gangs. When the Hells Angels went to war with a rock machine, it was almost like free fire. Uh, it was a real battleground. 
was like being in Colombia or Latin America. They're bombing in people's neighborhoods now. They're bombing in grocery stores. They're like terrorists. It was the bloodiest biker war ever in North America. By the end of the war, 160 people lay dead. Another 200 were wounded. But one attack changed the game forever. There was no way you couldn't see the children playing right across the street. And he didn't care. The guy went boom, but he didn't care. Montreal. This historic city is just 45 miles from the U.S. border. The region is home to over 100 members of the world's most violent outlaw motorcycle gang, the Hells Angels. The Hells Angels rule supreme. They have a biker monopoly. They will solve their problem the way the Hells Angels like to solve their problem, which is with blood and bullets. But control of the border drug trade wasn't given to the Hells Angels. They had to take it. In the mid-1970s, the Hells Angels were a well-oiled criminal machine. Their drug franchise netted millions of dollars a year. And they regularly did battle with other motorcycle gangs. But they wanted to expand their empire. And the bikers north of the border seemed like easy marks for these outlaws. There's a general feeling in Canada that we're about 10 years behind the United States. So they were a bunch of guys that rode Harleys. They, uh, their idea of a good time was drinking beer on the weekend, maybe getting into a fight in a bar somewhere. Recruiting members was no problem for the Angels. They saw stuff on TV, and they saw Hell's Angels in the United States, things like that, and they wanted to look like them. Uh, then we saw it coming slowly but surely, and you saw the long hair coming in, and uh, the muscles and the, the leather jackets. In 1977, the New York chapter of the Hell's Angels was the first to look north. They targeted the drug and prostitution rings. So in December, 35 new recruits were asked to join the Hells Angels. They set up in a clubhouse outside of the city near the border. There was only one problem. The Angels weren't the only game in town. The Outlaws motorcycle gang was also seeking to expand their operation. But the Angels wouldn't stand for any competition. They gave their rival a simple ultimatum. Members of the Outlaws were basically told it's the Hells Angels way. Either you die or you get out of here. Leading the war against the Outlaws was Eve Trudeau, AKA Apache. Eve Apache Trudeau uh, really was a king among the killers. He was pretty unassuming, but what he, what he lacked in size, he, he certainly uh, made up in, in meanness and in just ruthlessness. He was not somebody you wanted to cross. Apache was deadly with a gun. But he was also a bomb maker. Before becoming an angel, he'd had a job at an explosives factory. It's there that he learned how to make bombs. And it's there that he learned where to get the dynamite and steal it and how to put things together. And he showed it to other members. The lineage goes right back to infinite bombings. The bombs became a favorite weapon in the battle with the outlaws. 
it became their style. It was a flamboyant style, sent very good messages, scared the hell out of everybody. The outlaws were overwhelmed almost immediately. By 1979, the Hells Angels had control across the border. But they didn't stop there. They wanted more, so they initiated a recruiting drive. They really wanted a lot of newer, younger bikers. But what they did was they recruited a different kind of biker. The new ones wanted to make money. These young guys, they wanted to follow the American model. They wanted to get rich. Tensions began to grow between the business-minded new recruits and the bar-brawling older members. The new recruits continued operating in the South, and the older members, including Apache, formed a second chapter further north. The internal hostility simmered. The North was messing up business, especially the Angels' efforts to corner the cocaine trade. The North chapter is renowned for not only being the meanest, but for being the most unreliable. In fact, a lot of the other bikers feel that too much of the cocaine is going up their noses and not into the streets. In March 1985, things hit a breaking point. Orders were issued from New York. The North chapter was getting sloppy. They needed to be cleaned up. March 24th, 1985. The North chapter attended a party at a newly established clubhouse. Five Hells Angels rode up, parked their bikes, and walked into the clubhouse. Inside, the South chapter was armed and waiting. When the smoke cleared, the five Northern Angels lay dead. After they put bullets into their bodies, they wrapped them up in sleeping bags and weighed them down in chains and dumped the bodies into the St. Lawrence River. Two months later, their bodies began floating to the surface. Their message is, don't mess with us. We're the Hell's Angels, the most dangerous guys in town. And what better proof of that, that you're not only willing to kill your enemies, you are willing to kill your own. The house cleaning failed to tie up an important loose end. Apache Trudeau. When he learned the Angels had a contract out on his life, Apache decided to cooperate with police. The confession he made was shocking. Eve Apache Trudeau, by his own admission, tells the cops he has committed personally 43 executions, 29 with a firearm, 10 with bombs. Three he beats to death, and one he strangles. 43. Eve Apache Trudeau was a one-man killing machine. But Apache didn't take the fall alone. He flipped on the Angels. Using his information, police arrested and convicted 21 Hells Angels who had been involved in what was dubbed the Lennoxville Massacre. Of the 21 charged, four were convicted of murder. The sentences meant almost half of the Angels were now behind bars. But a new crop of recruits were patiently waiting in the shadows. Among those waiting to fill the void was 33-year-old Maurice Mom Boucher. Mom had a certain charisma. Uh, he scared a lot of people. I mean, I, I always said the only respect that this guy ever got was uh, from intimidation. While some were disgusted by the Angel's vicious house cleaning, Boucher was impressed. 
after the massacre, he decided he wanted to be a Hells Angel. He thought that that is the way business should be run. So he went to headquarters, and they welcomed him with open arms, and he became a full patch member very quickly. Mom Boucher quickly fell in with another recruit climbing the ranks. 34-year-old Walter Stadnick, a.k.a. Nurgit. Walter Stadnick stands only five feet four, not very big, uh, but always had a kind of fierceness in his eyes and just a rugged determination. Stadnick was also a natural diplomat. Walter Stadnick from the beginning was the man who had vision. He realized you needed guns, you needed brawn, you needed bullets, but you also needed charm. Walter was the angel's golden boy with connections across the country. For years, the gang had been looking to expand, and Walter Stadnick became the Angel's ambassador. Stadnick played brains to Mom Boucher's brawn, and both rose. Boucher was named chapter president, and Stadnick became national president of the Hells Angels, north of the border. Walter and Mom were very ambitious, and I think they realized very quickly that they were the future of the Hells Angels. That future would be both lucrative. Two million dollars a month just in street change. And bloody. Whoever's wearing the patch, kill them. The Hells Angels. For more than four decades, the world's largest outlaw motorcycle gang has used brute force to expand their empire to 31 countries around the globe. The Angels have taken that violence to another level. The Hells Angels attitude, it's look, if you want to stay here, you have to join us. If you don't, we'll kill you. Some chapters in the US said, wow, these guys are a little scary. The Angels have taken control of the drug trade across the border in true 1% fashion. The American Motorcycle Association said, well, this is only the 1% of people that ride bikes that cause problems. Of course, they thought that was great. We're 1%, we're different, so they adopted the 1% image. All Hell's Angels share one thing their patch. Everybody knows what that patch is, you know? It isn't called the patch of brotherly love or let's kiss and make up. It's called the death end. The angels ride Harley Davidsons, a nod to their all-American roots. They also wear gear like club rings, necklaces, and t-shirts. All these items are considered club property, subject to collection at any time. Even Hells Angels tattoos can be collected if you leave the club in bad standing. If you don't remove your tattoos, they would burn them off or scrape them off. To become a patched-in member is a long road for any angel. You have to understand that to get into the Hells Angels, it's harder than to get into the U.S. Army or the police. Recruits begin as hangarounds. This status allows them to attend some club functions in order to prove themselves to the membership. Then, applicants become prospects. It's a hazing period in which recruits cannot refuse any order given by the membership. Lots of people fail. 
the prospecting process has been called tyrannical, intolerable. The vast majority of prospects are chased off. Those who survive must then earn 100% of the membership vote to become a full patch member. The process can take years. In seeking to control the drug trade, the Angels have set new standards for ruthlessness. One way is by using smaller biker gangs called puppet clubs. The Hells Angels north of the border use the Rockers as their henchmen. The Rockers, they're like the dog soldiers. They're the, the pawns in the chess game. And uh, they're looking to move into the back row of the bishops, knights, and the kings. There are two groups called the baseball team and the football team within the Rockers that serve the gang's extreme criminal needs. There's a euphemisms for their, their hit squad. And the Hells Angels would say, okay, send out the baseball team. That meant go over there with baseball bats and beat the guy up. When things got much more serious, the, uh, well, what's more dangerous than a, a baseball team, a football team? The most brutal members of the Angels and Rockers are awarded a patch that reads, Filthy Few. The Rockers also keep the Angels at arm's length from criminal activity. So you use puppet gangs to insulate the real core of the membership, so if something happens, all right, if we're gonna lose anybody, I will lose one or two of these guys. Somebody's gonna get killed, somebody's gonna go to jail, well, there you go. To further insulate the upper echelons of membership, the HA have a group of angel elites called the Nomads. For these members, power is nearly limitless. Nomads don't ask permission. Nomads say, I can do what I want. I'll go into any place and I'll take over and that's the way it is. And if you don't like it, try and fight us. Nomads exist throughout the Angel's Empire and have been especially effective at expanding the gang's drug territory and profits. Unlike their brothers in the Western US, who dominate the crystal meth trade, these Angels deal primarily in cocaine and lots of it. Undercover agent Cal Broker, who infiltrated the Angels, says the amounts they're willing to buy are astronomical. The last project I was working on, uh, we were bringing in 40,000 metric tons of coke. You know, you want a load in, I'll get you a load in. The Hells Angels take another street level cut of the profits through a group called The Table. The Angels' drug empire has grown so large that it can't be contained by borders. It's known that the, the largest unprotected border in the, in the world between Canada and, and the United States is a sieve for drugs. It's crime without borders. With their drug machine well-oiled, the Angels let everyone know they are the only game in town. You try to buy your stuff from the Hells Angels. You don't, they'll break your legs, they'll kill you. The Hells Angels had grown so violent that they declared war on anyone who dared challenge them. You would see constant news of another gangland sling. So it would be a burnt out corpse found in a field. And then there'd be the bombings. Even innocent citizens were caught in the crossfire. This really was a war. 
in every sense of the word. Montreal, 1995. The Hells Angels were fighting a bloody war with rival gang, The Rock Machine, for control of the city's drug trade. The Angels' leader, Mom Boucher, had become the most feared and well-known criminal in the city. He was full patch all the way. This guy would walk around Montreal with patches on, and he wanted people to know I'm the boss. And Mom knew how to motivate his soldiers. Mom Boucher basically told their membership and their underlings, if you kill a full patch member of the rock machine, we'll pay you $100,000. Whoever's wearing the patch, kill them. As the angels climbed to the top, no one was safe. Not even the innocent. August 9th, 1995. The Hells Angels blew up a jeep. The driver, a suspected rock machine associate, was killed instantly. 11-year-old Daniel DeRossier was playing across the street. One of the pieces of shrapnel embedded itself in the head of 11-year-old Daniel DeRossier. He died four days later. Police were shocked when they learned how the bomb was detonated. What hurt me is that this was a remote control device. This was actually somebody who had to be nearby and pressing a button. You saw those kids. You had to see the kids. There was no way you couldn't see the children playing right across the street. The murder sparked public outcry. That single killing changed the face of the biker wars in Canada. There was such outrage, such anger, where people, the politicians, and the police finally said, enough is enough. And the Hells Angels realized that they had made a costly mistake. In response, the authorities formed an elite task force named Wolverine to target the biker gangs. The team was successful in making more than 130 arrests. The rock machine couldn't survive the two-front war and were forced to surrender to the Angels. Wolverine inflicted damage on the Hells Angels as well. But Boucher wasn't going to stand for it. We were seizing a lot of their money, and we were giving them a lot of trouble. And he probably looked in the mirror one day and said, they can't do that to me. I'm Mum Boucher. His response? Kill anyone involved in the justice system. He decides that he will take on the state. And he makes up a hit list of judges and lawyers and, and journalists and politicians and prison guards. And he wants to create sort of a, a reign of terror. June 1997. Under Mom Boucher's direct orders, prison guard Diane Levine was shot and killed by two Hells Angels assassins as she drove home from work. They started off killing a, a woman prison guard, and it was completely by hazard. I mean, she was chosen like that. The trigger man was immediately worried that he made a mistake in killing a woman. He alerted Mom Boucher. He said uh, the only problem, she had And Mom said, I'm going to you know, it didn't, didn't phase him, it didn't bother him. Mom's plan had been set in motion, and the reign of terror was just beginning. September 8th. Two Hells Angels drove to a bus stop near a local prison. At 6.30 a.m., 
an inmate transport bus with two prison guards on board stopped at a railroad crossing nearby. And as soon as it stopped, they opened up, shot through the windshield, and shot through the side door. 49-year-old guard Pierre Rondeau was killed instantly. The other guard escaped unharmed. Fear began to spread throughout the community. So now we have two prison guards killed uh, over the summer, and people realize that it's turning into terrorism. The terror campaign lasted for three months. Then, in December 1997, police caught a break when they arrested Stefan Gagné, a shooter from both prison guard murders. Gagné cracked during the interrogation and named Mom Boucher as the mastermind behind the hits. Boucher was arrested for two counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. He stood trial in November of 1998. It's the trial of the century. Everybody knows he's the leader of the Hells Angels. Everybody knows uh, the gang has been involved in a murderous biker war. Gagné was the key government witness, and it looked to be an open and shut case. In his final directions to the jury, the judge gave an unusual instruction telling the jurors to be especially careful of accepting the testimony of a criminal. He says, you know, a witness who is not credible, you don't know when he is telling the truth and when he is not telling the truth. November 27th. A mob of Hells Angels crowded the courtroom to hear the verdict. It came back, not guilty. He says, not guilty. Of everything, too, everything. Yeah. And to me, we went, huh? That's nuts. The judge says, you're a free man. So he jumps over the gate. They grab him, they put him on his shoulders. And as they get out the door, and then the jackets come off and all the full patches are there. And they're yelling and screaming. Many would have taken a vacation. Not Mom Boucher. Later that same night, Andre Bouchard was working as a judge at a boxing match. So I'm sitting there, and I'm still feeling the, the repercussions of the not guilty. And all of a sudden, there's a light. The guy who was working the lights hit one of the entrances. And we all looked up like that, and I saw Mumbushi coming down, and he had a black leather jacket, and he pulled it off, and he had his colors. I'd say 2,000 people stood up in the arena and applauded him. And that broke my heart. This guy was a killer. Mom Boucher was living large. But authorities had not forgotten that he'd ordered the assassination of multiple members of law enforcement. There is a kind of unwritten rule, even among criminals, right? We've got our job, we're the bad guys. You've got your job, you're the cops. Um, and now it had been crossed. And there was fear, but there was also loathing, and there was anger. Montreal. Hell's Angels leader Mom Boucher, recently acquitted of ordering the murder of two prison guards, was living the high life. And he wanted everyone, including law enforcement, to know it. He starts driving around in this souped up old car. It's called Mum's Machine. And then another thing written on the car is, kill them all. And uh, people are applauding him as he drives by, and the police who are doing surveillance on him just cannot believe it. But Mom was living on borrowed time. In October 2000, he was rearrested after an appeal by a federal prosecutor. With Mom Boucher behind bars, the fate of the Angels rested on the shoulders of Walter Stadnick. Stadnick put a plan in place that would cement his legacy with the gang forever. 
Walter Stadnick comes up with a brilliant idea. There are about 150 to 200 bikers who are members of disparate small groups. He offers something that the Hells Angels have never done, patch for patch. Basically, you join us, no questions asked. You give us your patch, you will become a member of the Hells Angels. Gang members were bussed to a party and more than 150 recruits received their patches. And these were people who, you know, mere months ago were shooting at Hells Angels on site. Now they were wearing Hells Angels patches. Just months later, the authorities launched one of the biggest biker crackdowns in history. Operation Springtime. Hundreds of police officers stage coordinated attacks in cities across the country and basically chop off the leadership of the Hells Angels. In all, 128 Hells Angels were arrested, including Stadnik. He was charged with conspiracy to commit murder and drug trafficking. He was eventually convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison. In spring 2002, Mom Boucher's luck ran out. After a short retrial, he was found guilty on two counts of murder and one count of attempted murder of the prison guards. He was given 25 years. So, you know, that really felt good and I always remember they cuffed him and uh, he never saw the light a day after that was it. Despite constant pressure from law enforcement, the Angels remain the most powerful motorcycle gang in North America, controlling both sides of the U.S. border. Right now, the Hells Angels are still the dominant force in organized crime. Uh, they're handling the drug trade, uh, prostitution, all of the things they've ever done. While cocaine is king in the East, the marijuana trade rules in the West. It's known that the huge amount of drugs that the Hells Angels bring into British Columbia in the West make their way steadily into the United States. BC butt marijuana is traded on the streets in California because it's so potent. The Angels control a significant part of the $6 billion annual pot trade. The gang has also been making inroads in the booming meth trade. Meth is the, is the cheap drug. What we see now is it's starting to come into Canada. It's coming in BC, it's coming into uh, in the western part of Canada. Uh, Ontario, slowly but surely. Andre Bouchard has retired from his days of battling the Angels. With Mom Boucher in prison, the gang wars are largely over. But he warns that doesn't mean the Angels have slowed down. Narcotics is being sold like it was. We know they're still scaring people, hurting people, killing people, and intimidating people. Undercover agent Cal Broker put in eight years infiltrating the Angels. He has left undercover work and now lives his life in full view. He knows he will always be a target. If I was worried about my safety or what would happen to me, I wouldn't have started this stuff in the beginning. You don't play with snakes and expect not to get bit. The Hells Angels have proven resilient, taking hits from law enforcement and coming back stronger. Their aim is still global dominance. I've traveled around the world and people know the Hells Angels the way they know the, the Nike swoosh and the art the golden arches of McDonald's, you know. It's a it's a well known brand name across the world and and they will be around for a long, long time.